Hi, everybody. Oh, those lights are bright. <laughs> so, I'm Michael Brownlee. I'm the co-founder of Local Food Shift in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, we've been working towards uh, localizing our emerging food shed, our regional food shed, for several years now. And we see slow money as an essential strategy in getting there. We have a long way to go, but momentum is growing as it is almost everywhere. This, this afternoon, to me, is really what slow money is all about. In, in our slow money investment clubs in Colorado, we've been hearing lots and lots of, uh, you know, entrepreneurial pitches and presentations and making some investments, of course. But in the process, we've been learning a great deal about our food system and just how hard it is to shift it to local. Urban agriculture is taking root in cities everywhere, but it's often mostly invisible, you know, below the radar of almost everyone. But it is a very exciting development in the process of localizing our food supply. Back in Denver, we've learned that in the city that there are 22,000 acres of unused land. This is a study done by Professor John Brett at the University of Colorado, Denver. But he figured that only 2,000 acres of that land would be needed to produce all of the city's produce needs. Really interesting perspective. Last year, the, the mayor of Denver, Michael Hancock, set an official goal for the city of 20% local food by 2020. But after more than two years of working on this, I can tell you that he does not yet have a plan to get there. How do we get there? That's what we're all learning together, I think. As, as we're rebuilding local food systems across the country, we are seeing social entrepreneurs beginning to address the challenges and the opportunities of access to local food in our cities. And these five presenters today are among the early stage innovative leaders who are pioneering the way forward. And it's a great privilege to be with them here this afternoon and to have them share their stories. First up from Louisville, Kentucky, uh, Karen Moskowitz, founder of New Roots, who is bringing together local food, local farmers, and local families. Karen. <laughs> Welcome everyone to, contrary to what Mayor Fisher told you yesterday, it's not the city of bourbonism, but the city of kohlrabiism. <laughs> and where one small nonprofit, New Roots, has ignited community leaders from our city's most underinvested neighborhoods to deliver one small but elegant solution to food deserts. And I'm humbled and privileged to represent the hundreds of volunteer leaders scattered around the city, our, our shareholders and our Fresh Stop, investors in New Roots, and our mostly entrepreneur Board of Directors. So back in 2007, when I first moved here to town and began organizing around this issue, I heard a lot of typical answers to this deep difficulty of food deserts that, to me, felt like very alienating to people who were dealing with food insecurity and felt very top-down and unsustainable. They ended up costing a lot of money, and while some were somewhat successful, we, they were not successful in reaching the many, many people and the large amounts of food we need for people to consume enough to live healthy lives. And while farmers' markets were rocking in one side of our city here, there were, they were failing on the other side, mostly because we couldn't get farmers to come, not to this end of the city, not one. which led me to an epiphany. And that epiphany came from some friends in Cleveland, Ohio, from City Fresh, which is that cooperative economics is a movement that although it's been alive and well in African American and other immigrant communities that were marginalized or worse upon entering this country, needed to have a resurgence. <laughs> What I mean by cooperative economics and how we do it here in Kentucky is the, pres the premise that one family alone may not be able to afford to go to a grocery store or farmer's market, 
and be able to buy fresh local food at retail prices. But by pooling cash and SNAP benefits on a sliding scale, so lower income families being subsidized by higher income families, but all getting the same amount of food, pooling all this cash and food stamps for let's say 75 people at a time, we had the power to negotiate wholesale prices with the very same farmers and some new ones who before had been unwilling to come to the food deserts. And this is called a fresh stop, this community-driven project, which is sort of like a cross between a fruit and vegetable flash mob and a family reunion. <laughs> Nobody ever wants to leave, although they pop up for only two hours. We have a hard time getting people out of the door because they are forming the most wonderful, beautiful food community you've ever seen. Mm. It eliminated the risk to farmers and it overcame the price barriers to consumers who couldn't afford to buy this food before. They pop up right now in five different locations in Louisville every other week from June to October. So imagine a community supported agriculture where the people who are themselves dealing with food insecurity are running the show in partnership with farmers and where shareholders can opt in and out of the growing season instead of having to pay the full amount, an affordable full amount at the beginning. So in 2009, I invested one unemployment check to incorporate New Roots as a nonprofit, and I did what any nice Jewish girl would do, I started to call churches. <laughs> and it was, it, it, I gathered up my nerve to call pastors and insinuate myself upon them to share the pulpit on a Sunday to ask people in the congregations their thoughts on food justice. Mm. I made 60 calls and I found one match and this partner is now entering its sixth year as one of our model fresh stops. But it wasn't easy at all and what I had to deal with was a lack of trust from other white community organizers who'd come before me with promises and, and grant money and then leave when the grant money was, was gone. So why is it working here? It's working because our leadership is embedded in the community and we're not going away. It's because I'm truly not happy unless everyone is eating their vegetables all day long, even for breakfast. Just ask my poor 15-year-old daughter <laughs> and the Fresh Stop shareholders and I have the tenacity of a pit bull. I finished already two careers in biotechnology and environmental consulting, earned my MBA, but now I'm pounding the pavements for a PhD in street cred, and that's what you get when you show up and you don't go away. Which leads me to one of the most important components of the Fresh Stop, which is our beloved farmers, many of here who are here today, and if you can't find them, just look for the overalls, because they wanted to make sure you could find them later. They love us, and they love getting to sit down with the community every December and, and be able to share what seeds they would like to purchase and the community asking them what they would want them to grow for them, get a commitment for the upcoming season and not have to risk selling at a farmer's market and wondering what to sell. They get to farm instead. So at New Roots, here, here, here's one of our farmers. We invest in our leaders at New Roots. This past season, we had 650 shareholders connected to about 35 farmers. We work with a consortium of African-American farmers who themselves felt disenfranchised by the system. And now today, after one and a half seasons under their belt with fresh stops, Andre Barber just secured a $10,000 Kiva Zip loan. He was the uh, raised money faster than anyone else in the history of Kiva Zip, $10,000 where he is, yep. And, there are uh, 12 other minority farmers in the consortium. They've created a mini aggregation facility in Hart County, about 80 miles south of here. And this year, we were also privileged to win first place in the Yom Ignite Challenge here in Louisville as a top nonprofit for our board development and our, and our branding. One of our uh, new offshoots is our VeggieRx project that is just finishing up this coming Monday where we had about 25 families come through and cook with us and share information, run food justice classes, and get free veggies instead of pharmaceuticals. So what's in our future? So our future is feisty, and that's why we want you to join us. With our Fresh Stop Training Institute, 
we are training neighborhood leaders all at one time in fresh up best practices. So where before we were afraid to take on too much because we felt like we couldn't afford to do it and would be too overwhelmed, we decided to do the exact opposite of what made sense and invite every single leader in the community into the Fresh Stop Training Institute, which kicked off in August. We now have six new Fresh Stops in the Training Institute, two that are outside Louisville, so we are spreading into the bluegrass, uh, and we um, are testing our first rural Fresh Stop in Meade County this coming season, and our goal is within two years, all Fresh Stop leaders have learned the best practices of running Fresh Stop, including negotiating with farmers, running Excel spreadsheets so that you could keep track of shareholders and all of that amazing work that goes into this and within two years be able to be spun off so we can keep working with new communities. So last year we were able to raise from investments $165,000. We need $200,000 a year for the next five years to scale our model up. This is an investment of only $250 a year per family. And why so cheap? because we have become experts at leveraging other people's resources. Just like Wendell said yesterday, why buy new when you could just borrow or reuse? We utilize church infrastructure, we utilize our farmers' infrastructure, although we help them achieve you know, what they need to achieve. So we are a great investment. And we here in Kentucky, as you've been hearing, are very uniquely situated to feed ourselves. We have more farms per capita than any other state but Iowa. We have more water. And we've shown at New Roots that the, there is demand in the food deserts for this beautiful food and our farmers are ready. So what do you get? So we're not a nonprofit, so you're not gonna receive monetary returns. What you're gonna get is um, an increase in the net worth of our farmers base by we're hoping over 100% in just one year. The very customer base that we've been talking about all week who we want to eat this food and who in fact are demanding this food and overcoming the barriers. We're gonna give huge returns on neighborliness by connecting black, white, rural, urban, young, old, and we will provide enormous dividends and community resilience because of that. Take a big stab at our health epidemic, put a big dent in industrial food system. And as you've witnessed over the past two days with the presence of our 10 African-American leaders who traveled from within the city and beyond, we are going to diversify the leadership of this movement. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Karen. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce from Columbia, Missouri, Jake Davis of Root Cellar Grocer, a food hub focused on providing food access to rural areas. Hello. In 2011, Chelsea and I purchased The Root Cellar, a small retail store in downtown Columbia, Missouri, focused on local food. This was more out of frustration by a couple of farm kids than a deep desire to own a grocery store. After struggling for years to build a small farm from scratch as a quote-unquote hobby, while working professionally on food and farm issues, we realized that the food system required drastic change. After learning that the root cellar would likely close its doors without new ownership, we saw our opportunity to put our money where our mouth is. The truth is that neither of us had worked a single day in the grocery business. And although that resulted in a lot of sleepless nights, it also became one of our most powerful assets. Without the industrial grocery model clouding our decision making, we began building a farmer-focused business, one that relied on patrons who embraced seasonal eating and cared about the environment, local farmers, and their community. As a community-based micro-retailer, we provide all the basics for fresh home-cooked meals at a fraction of the conventional grocery store's impact. Our model connects the growing consumer demand for food with integrity to farmers who respect the soil, animals, and their neighbors. We believe that real food is seasonal, local, and sustainable. The Root Cellar's core product, a weekly local food subscription program, much like a multi-farm CSA, is one of our most powerful tools for change. The constant demand for local food allows us to work closely with farmers, providing technical support, guaranteeing fair prices for large purchases, and promoting production flexibility. 
A few examples include guaranteeing beginning farmer Katie and Will's first ever crop, nearly 600 seed sunflowers, and working with Jeannie and Gary of Show Me Produce to experiment with unconventional items like ginger and Jerusalem artichokes. But our effort to reinvigorate Missouri's local food system goes far beyond simply buying and selling farm products. We work with small-scale producers to preserve seasonally abundant fruits and vegetables. We work with sustainable livestock growers to purchase whole animals, coordinate meat processing, and even educate consumers about the value of every cut of meat to ensure whole animal utilization. By participating at every level of the supply chain, increasing consumer knowledge, increasing consumer knowledge, and focusing on seasonal items, Root Cellar is able to share 60 cents of every dollar with the producer. Nearly four times the national average. We have achieved this. We've achieved this while growing our subscription program from 20 to over 300 families in just three years. And increasing revenues from less than $100,000 annually to a projected $600,000 in 2014. Looking ahead, we see an opportunity to use this model to reach new communities. Local food has become a priority in many urban centers, but rural communities are often overlooked and underserved. This leaves rural residents without access to high quality, locally produced products. We believe that our experience as local food aggregators, retailers, and citizens of rural Missouri uniquely position root cellar to begin addressing the problem of good food access in these smaller communities. In 2014, we began a pilot project uh, offering our weekly subscription program at a temporary site in Jefferson City, Missouri, population 43,000. In the first season, we received over 75 subscriptions without, with very little outreach. This desire for healthy local food in Jefferson City has solidified our plan to reach more rural communities. In the next two years, we plan to establish three new micro retail locations offering our weekly subscription in small towns throughout Missouri. This expansion will enhance local food access in the rural communities and also strengthen our farmer network in these regions. We're excited to announce that the root seller has been selected by the United States Department of Agriculture to receive a local food promotion program grant to support this effort. But we are seeking an additional $250,000 in support to ensure that rural Missourians have access to real food. We sincerely appreciate the dedication of Slow Money, our fellow entrepreneurs, and everyone involved in the hard work of building a better food system. Thank you very much. And next from Cincinnati, Ohio, Ryan Doan of Urban Greens, who are reclaiming unused land for urban farming. Hello, friends. Um, first, a little bit about myself. Uh, about six years ago, I was looking for a way out of uh, urban equity, uh, private equity financing, and it was a pretty miserable existence. So I started researching um, like local food. I found a mentor in Cincinnati uh, through working through a community council, uh, became active in my community council, and, and luckily for me, a man uh, in my own neighborhood who'd been growing his own food on a 3,000 square foot plot uh, invited me over to his house uh, and mentored me for a year. Um, that really blew my mind. Uh, not only was he able to grow food for himself and for his wife, uh, he gave a lot of the food away, uh, preserved a lot of it for the winter, and really had a very low impact lifestyle. Um, this completely changed my life, and it was the seed uh, for the idea to start Urban Greens. Uh, next, okay. So uh, a little bit of facts and figures since I'm a numbers guy. Um, Urban Greens right now primarily on a half acre in the east end of Cincinnati. Uh, we got our land from the city. Uh, we started with a, a sixth of an acre in 2009. Um, and then the next year the city was really happy with us so they gave us another one third of an acre. Um, from that combined one half an acre we were able to grow this year uh, about 12,000 pounds of produce. 
um, produced about $40,000 in revenue, supplied one full-time job and a host of other part-time jobs. Uh, we provided uh, food to uh, 60 CSA customers, two restaurants, um, and uh, two farmers markets. Um, I think the, the really interesting thing to note is uh, this year we are gonna turn a slight profit in only our third year. Um, the way that we're able to do that, um, sales of course are increasing. I mean, there's a surging demand for the product. Um, but really the more interesting thing to note is we've found ways through um, bartering and through um, reducing, reusing, and recycling from things that people throw away in the community to uh, basically provide tremendous value from these things. Um, I mean, one example is I used to have to rent a dump truck to go get uh, aged manure and uh, leaves. Um, now one of my CSA customers goes and runs uh, loads for me because he has a construction company and I just provide him with vegetables. So that's just one small example of a way that I've been able to reduce my expenses and uh, kind of find a way to profitability. 70% um, of our revenue is paid as labor and I think that number is gonna pretty much hold true as we go uh, forward, um, including when we expand. And I in, and basically uh, intend to essentially be a pass-through. As customers provide me with money, like I said, 70% of that money is essentially gonna go directly to the farmers who are doing the work. Um, we have invested $25,000 to date uh, to basically build this system. Um, I'm looking for another twenty-five dollars to $50,000 to essentially replicate this system. Um, people are approaching me now all over the city, including the city of Cincinnati and private landowners that are offering me land. Um, kids are coming from me from the universities looking for work. Um, so really the only missing piece of the puzzle is more capital to make this happen. Um, a buzzword it, within the sustainability community is abundance. Um, people talk a lot about abundance, but really there's very few examples of it around. Um, the reason why I decided to do this within the city, you know, I had ideas of getting my own homestead and just checking out from society, as many people have done. But I thought I would just go right to the root of the problem and put this right in front of people's face. Um, you know, we got 22,000 square feet and we just pack it so full of vegetables um, and hand it uh, to our customers. I mean, the, uh, one, one week this year, we handed out a $55 CSA bag to uh, 60 customers. Um, and again, this all came from a half an acre. Um, the other thing that we do with, you know, in terms of abundance, not only do I feed myself and my 60, uh, you know, CSA customers, but all the employees eat the food too. So these kids come to me having never really eaten vegetables and we teach them how to use it. So we teach them from the very, you know, basics um, how to, you know, do stir fries and salads to, you know, how to preserve it, how to blanch the, the greens, you know, to freeze them for the winter, how to make spaghetti sauce, how to make salsa, um, you know, how to make relish, how to actually eat the food. We have very little waste, actually. Um, you know, the first, the best of the produce goes to the CSA customers, uh, myself and the employees eat the rest, and then we have some chickens that eat the stuff that's not as good uh, for the people. <laughs> um, I think we have a tremendous advantage in local food and I don't think people talk about it enough. Um, if we could just communicate with the outside world that we actually, what fresh picked is, and fresh isn't just some word that's copyrighted by some big box store. Fresh picked means, oh no, like the food that you are receiving today, I just picked it this morning. And there's a reason why it lasts longer in your refrigerator and there's a reason why it tastes better because it just came from the plant. So I think if we just communicated this with our customers, then they would, the, the value would rise in their mind and they would uh, feel comfortable paying the prices that we need to break even on our, uh, on our ventures. And actually there was a case study that was done by Northern Kentucky University by some, some of their marketing students where they surveyed my customers and that's exactly what the problem is. If you just increase the, the perceived value of the produce to the customers, they see the value rise in their minds and they're willing to pay it. So I think that all we need to do is stretch stress the competitive advantage that we have within this industry and that's that we pick it fresh and that we pretty much turn it very quickly directly into the hands of the customers. Um, I would be remiss if I did not mention people power. Um, I realized very shortly that I could not do this on my own. Um, I've been able to garner community support, um, get, like I said, help from the community, uh, help from the universities. We've built such a beautiful community of people. My life has been changed for the better. 
and I'm just really looking to spread, uh, spread the good news. So um, like I said, I'm really just looking to have uh, further this conversation in the future, uh, particularly with people from Cincinnati. Uh, if you would like to have this uh, conversation with me, I'll look forward to it. Thank you. Up in Boston, Glenn Lloyd leads the Urban Farming Institute, providing training to beginning urban farmers. Glenn. Good afternoon. How are you all doing out there? Well, the the post-lunch crowd. I actually, I, I wanted to start with, by saying what probably is an obvious statement, but I, I feel the, the urge to say it, and that is ownership is power, and equi equitable ownership takes time. And, uh, and I think that's a big part of the equation as, you know, I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the, I think, the power shifting business. We, we, we need to shift more power to folks who have less of it. And um, yeah, I, I agree, right? So first, a little bit about me. I, I spent the better part of the last 20 years building um, City Fresh Foods, which is a, uh, a Boston food service uh, business. We deliver about 12,000 meals a day um, to child care, to school age kids, to elderly, providing a, um, a healthy alternative. Um, and, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm actually talking about, I wanna talk about urban farming because it was through my uh, company that I got very interested in where our food comes from. And the quick story was, um, I'm driving down Hell Street in Roxbury and I'm noticing all this vacant land. And I'm also, that next day in my kitchen, realizing that we're buying this romaine lettuce and head lettuce from California. I'm saying, wait a second, we should, we should be able to provide some of this stuff right out of our, out of our own land, close to, close to where we live and where we're working. So today I'm here actually um, to have a conversation about urban farming and representing uh, the Urban Farming Institute. I'm one of the founding board members. And I think the Urban Farming Institute along with its partnership with City Fresh, uh, I'm sorry, with City Growers, is a, is a, is a pioneering organization uh, leading the development of urban farming in Massachusetts. There is something special happening, not just in Louisville, Kentucky, but in Boston. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, really, it's a movement led by young community leaders. And I'm actually inspired by them. And they're actually joined by a confluence of all kinds of, uh, of folks, which include community and polit political leaders, academics, investors, all varieties of hues and classes, all working towards a more localized food production, make, making localized food production viable. And our, our core is, is this thing around urban farming. And, and frankly, uh, we're on the early side of this experiment. We know that urban farming is not going to feed all of the city's dense population, but combined with peri-urban and rural growers, it can be an important part of the local food strategy. So the bottom line that we asked is, how do we use the underutilized assets in our community? One, like land. And there's a whole history why we have vacant land in our urban communities. White flight, people burning down their homes to get the insurance side. We still have a lot of that left, but actually, there's some pressure now coming uh, with, um, we were talking to folks the other night about gentrification. But there's still a lot of open space in our community. And we also have a lot of underutilized talent, like my neighbors. And we have a lot of demand for this fresh, healthy, local product. Now, this really, for me, it's been a story about incubation. And the highlight of this story is actually the people I've been, I've been um, privileged to work with on the urban farming side. So I want to introduce you to some of them. First, let me introduce you to Bobby. Bobby was an avid gardener at the age of nine, and over the last four years, he became a master urban farmer. And now he's actually the first trainer for the Urban Farming Institute, and he's training that next crop of, of urban farmers, and, he, and, he's, and, he's, and he's, he's, he's a specialist at it. He actually also counsels the enterprise team that is growing from market. And this is, this is Tristan, who actually is a Dorchester, Dorchester bred, uh, born and raised. And he used to hang around the farm a few years back, kind of volunteering, and couldn't get enough of it. He, along with eight others, was the first cohort of trainees that went through a 16-hour classroom training and 200 hours on the field. And upon graduation, he actually became our second farm manager. So he actually manages the enterprise team, and he's joined by some of his classmates. Mick D, second to me, the hardest working brother in Boston. He, he, um, 
he's actually an architect by trade and, uh, and, and no nonsense, uh, you know, McD. And this is the Sada who uh, we call her the truth teller, uh, not, never afraid to, to speak her mind. They make up the production side of the equation, and I will talk about, a little bit about that in a second. And they're joined by Jamie, who is actually a former restaurant owner. And Jamie uh, does all the account management, does sales, and, uh, and does the bookkeeping. And together, they're joined by the, 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 the current owners, which is myself and, um, and Margaret, who are the, uh, the, the, the tip of the spear on the enterprise side. So the mechanics of what, what we do, um, on just over a half acre, it's, it's four parcels of land, and four days a week, we're harvesting, as Ryan says, some of the best stuff around. And we are actually uh, distributing wholesale. So we're supplying the local restaurants and uh, local retailers. And we actually, I'm very proud to say that this, this year we did a, an urban farmer's market in Dorchester. Um, so that's how, that's how the food moves. And um, the punchline is this year we did $42,000 of revenue on just over half an acre. So I'm gonna say that again, because I know we have some rural folks in town. $42,000 on just over half an, uh, half an acre. And this is based on folks who are just really uh, two to three years into urban farming. And I think that's pretty exciting. Yeah. So you can do the quick math. That's like a $1.40 uh, square foot. And that gets about $60,000 um, an acre. And actually, like Ryan, who I just met here, we take 70% of that and we redistribute out to the, to the, to the team. And they really, it's collective decision making because we want to think about alternative ways of how we do business as we look at building a new uh, food system. And our survival will be the strategic growth and the right support. So I'm actually, I'm getting the red here, so I'm going to really move quickly here. And that's where the Urban Farming Institute comes in. The Urban Farming Institute helps support this new industry uh, along with the new enterprises. And the first part is land. So we actually work with the Trust for Public Land, which is a national land trust. They get the land farm ready, and it's handed off to a local land trust called DNI, Deadly Neighborhood Initiative, which is part of the DSNI. And that creates land security for, for our farmers who are investing in the land. And uh, we talked about the, the training side, which is viable and very important. And part of the training piece, we want to make sure that it's the local folks who are closest land who are, who are being trained, coming in to be urban farmers. And finally is the advocacy and the policy. And interestingly enough, when we first started this, it wasn't legal to do urban farming, to grow food and, uh, and, and sell it in Boston. And I'm happy to announce this past year, we, we, we pushed it. And now the, 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 uh, the zoning laws have been amended so actually we can do urban agriculture in Boston. Change happens from the folks like us in the audience. So I'm definitely gonna summarize right quick. And that is, um, just quickly here. We have plenty of land. There's 800 acres in, in the Boston area. Most of our urban communities have this land. The market's robust. Trainings, trainers are being developed as we speak. And um, I did, it's all about compost. We, we all know that. And, and by the way, um, we have folks who, what we throw, 50, 60% of what we throw away can be turned into compost. So that's one advantage of urban farming, right? We have our, our soil creation happening right down the street from us. And, and I quickly, I, I threw this slide in because I wanted to say the sustainability of this, I think, of this new industry has to do with how we get the value back to these farmers. And back in our kitchen, we actually took this stuff and created what we're calling medical meals because you know, we, we can actually deal with chronic illnesses if we eat healthier. And, and we use this stuff to, um, to move uh, fresher, healthier food in. And how, the question is, how do we get this uh, dollar back to the farmers? I will end on that because I've used, I went over my time. So thank you. And in Chicago, Harry Rhodes heads up a group called Growing Home, which is a leading urban production farm. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here today with you. I sometimes get very depressed thinking about our food system and the challenges we face. And yet, today, after hearing all of these amazing farmers and entrepreneurs that have gone before me, I'm feeling much more optimistic. I'm Harry Rhodes. 
with Growing Home. I've been with Growing Home and helped found Growing Home a little over 13 years ago. And I'm very proud of the work we've done, the progress we've made, how we've turned Growing Home into the leading organic urban farm in Chicago today. We are at the interchange of social enterprise, transitional jobs, and community development in Chicago. Our mission is to operate, promote, and demonstrate the use of organic agriculture as a vehicle for job training, employment, and community, community development. We've seen this mission change lives, and we, our vision as a result of this mission is to see a world, a world with healthy people and a world with healthy communities. We are changing lives through organic agriculture. We operate a 14-week transitional jobs program where we give people with barriers to employment a real hands-on experience at our urban farms. Many of the people who come to us have been incarcerated, they've been homeless, they faced other challenges in getting a job. I could share with you many stories, but limited in time, I'll just tell you about DeAndre. DeAndre, DeAndre grew up on the south side of Chicago, and like many of his friends, DeAndre says, just about everyone I knew growing up was in a gang. Well, that gang led him to jail, led him to many challenges in his life. Over many years, he was in and out of jail. And when he got out of jail, he wanted to get a job. He finally felt like it was time to turn around his, his life, and yet all the doors were slammed in his face. Nobody would accept him. Until in 2012, he came to Growing Home. We said, are you ready to work? He said, yes, that's what I want. So we accepted him right away. DeAndre learned a lot with us. We learned a lot from him. And today, he is a crew leader. He is one of our full-time urban farmers. As DeAndre says, growing home is a great place to do better. And most of all, you rebuild your confidence in yourself and get ready to work. This is our hoop house at our year-round certified organic farm, the only certified organic farm in the city of Chicago. This picture was taken about three weeks ago, and yet I also saw a picture today on Facebook from our farm, 30 degrees outside, it still looks like this. We are harvesting on our farm from March through the end of December. This past year, on a little over an acre, over an acre mostly in hoop houses, we'll harvest 30,000 pounds of fresh vegetables in the city of Chicago. This 30,000 pounds will produce about $100,000 in sales. Our growth plan has been based in Englewood on the south side of Chicago. Any of you know of Englewood, you may have heard of people being shot there, of the crime rates, the high poverty rate, unemployment rate, all the negative things about Englewood. And yet, I've been working in Englewood since 2005, and I found many positive things going on there that are really exciting. In 2005, Englewood came up with a plan for its changing its community, and one of those ideas was an urban agriculture district, a district that would have urban farms, that would have opportunities through food and training programs, and that would create food enterprises, that would create hundreds and thousands of jobs for a community that's so in need of jobs and of change. We were invited to be part of that change. We developed our first year in 2006, our Wood Street Urban Farm, that's at the top of the diagram there. Three years later, we felt, found that we needed to keep growing, and so we developed our second farm, our extension farm. Now we're at the point where we're consolidating our efforts in Englewood, we're committed that, to that community, and we're looking at our next opportunity. Where can we get, take more vacant land? There's tens and hundreds of vacant land on the south side of Chicago, 
and turn them into productive, growing space. We're looking at that yellow site there for our next growth. It's privately owned, so we have a challenge of first acquiring that land and then figuring out what we're going to do with that land. Here's a sketch of what we possibly could do and some of the plans and ideas we have include increased growing space, a building with a new classroom so we could double the number of individuals we're training annually, new enterprises, possibly a community kitchen, cafe, garden center, anything to create new jobs and training opportunities in this community. We're looking now for planning for this new site. What, can we, what do we need to make it a reality? We need to do a feasibility study. We need a community planning process that will include local residents and entrepreneurs. We need a new business plan. All of this planning process will cost approximately $200,000. So far, we've raised $50,000, and today we're looking for another $150,000 so we can go on to do this planning process. It will allow us to scale up our enterprise, to impact more lives, and to change more lives in Englewood and around Chicago. Thank you so much. Now we get to get to the fun stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that in, in our discussion here this afternoon that, that uh, you'll have an opportunity to, to talk about some of the things that you couldn't put into your script but you'd really like to say. And, and I'm very interested in the kinds of questions you might have for each other. You know, we're all learning from each other, right? And, and please, if there are questions from the audience, uh, please uh, come up to the microphones uh, here pretty quick. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And those people who are watching online, I don't know how to get your questions here, but we'll figure that out next time. Uh, so maybe, maybe to, to start this off, I, I'm, I'm wondering about motivations, you know, your, your intentions in this. Is it about building a local food economy, or is it more about building access to local food and food justice? Any, anybody like to speak to that? I'd be happy to start. Um, I mean, I, I think that definitely uh, uh, it's both of those things. You know, I mean, it's, the truth is that, um, you know, food, food access and the ability for um, all spectrums of people to get access to food, whether it's low income or minorities or, or um, you know, those people of more means, it, it, expanding the access is one of the ways that we grow a real industry, a true economy around um, local food and, and around the idea of getting everyone fresh local meals uh, into their households. And, and so that has a lot to do with urban centers and it has a lot to do with rural areas. It has to do with, you know, pounding down the door any place we possibly can that doesn't have access to local food today and getting access there. Great. I mean, I'll just jump in quick. I, I mean, my perspective has been really it's about kind of community self-sufficiency. How do we really, it's like self-determination, how we get folks to kind of take care of their own ability to feed themselves. And it, looking at, you know, from the inner city all the way out, right? So if we look at, you know, the Roxbury, Dushers, Mattapan area, how do we get folks to kind of be able to feed themselves uh, more efficiently? Um, but also when you look at the whole statewide, people are looking at, okay, how does, how does Massachusetts feed itself, you know, in, in the long run? So, but start local. You know, as, as local as possible. And I, I'm just piggybacking on that, talking about community. Um, urban agriculture is very in, very sexy these days, but to me, urban agriculture is not a goal in and of itself. Urban agriculture um, can be used, all of us are using it as a way to build up community, to build up access, and to help change people's lives. What's, what's the hardest thing about doing this for you? Karen? Um, well, at first it was, um, I, I didn't really feel like we, we had the support of the local, state, or federal government. In fact, we don't really, you know, 
have that much support as far as financial support. But even but at the beginning, people were were telling us that we were part of the problem because we were driving prices down. Mm. And really, um, our, you know, our farmers can speak to that. I'll speak on behalf of them. They're really happy to be working with us because, you know, they're very diversified. So some of them do go to farmers markets, but some of them have left farmers markets and just want to work with Fresh Stop because they're guaranteed, you know, to, to get that check when they show up and drop off the food and they can go back and farm, you know. And so, um, and the hardest thing again was really, as I said, is, is gaining the trust of the community because so many people had come before me and, and burn that trust, and it's still there. So even though we've been around since 2009, we're working with new communities, and there's still the questions that are asked, you know, I, I don't know, you know, it's just people telling us they're fearful, you know, of starting down this road. And of course, we're mostly uh, run by volunteer power and the leadership, um, you know, so finding new leaders who want to step up and join the movement. And we have a very high retention of leadership, almost 100%. So once someone gets involved, they never want to leave because we have so much fun and we eat so well. You know, nobody wants to go away, so. Yeah. Ryan, what's hardest for you? Well, I mean, there's been a few bottlenecks. I think the number one bottleneck has been trained labor, um, finding enough money to pay these kids so that they want to stick around in the winter, um, you know, when there's less revenue. Um, I mean, basically, so you have turnover, so each year I have to train a new crop of farmers and just being able to afford to have that crew that sticks with me through the winter so that next year we can hit the ground running and produce more food. Um, that's been a bottleneck for me and part of the puzzle that urban agriculture uh, presents. I'm, I'm curious, do, do you encourage people to grow food themselves? Do you teach people how to grow food? I think that's a really important question. You know, for, I mean, I, we definitely encourage, um, you know, at the Root Cellar, we're a retail location. We encourage every level of the local supply chain. Every, we, you know, we would say, grow as much as you can in your backyard. If you can't grow it in your backyard, you can come and get it from us. But, but also, go get it at your local farmer's market if, you, if, you, if it's open that day. Or, um, you know, think about maybe visiting a farm and, and buying from that farm on farm occasionally. Because all those things are connected and, and they're not competitive. Lo local food is, uh, our real competition is corporate agribusiness. It's not each other. So, um, so, so working with each other um, is, is really powerful. So. Right. I've been successful through our CSA WorkShare program. So not everybody full pays for the CSA. Some people work as part of their obligation. Um, so I've actually had uh, quite a few customers that come in and, and have a work share for a couple years and then they're like, okay, I get it, I'm going to do it myself. So I don't mind that at all, actually, you know, I'm tickled by it. You know, I, somebody goes out and grows their own food, good, bring the next customer in and I'll teach them. Yeah, yeah it's, it's been amazing to watch how year to year the, the folks just get better and better at it, right? It's like, it's like they're learning from, I mean, farming is, is a lifetime, you know, education process, right? But, you know, we, these guys, the simple things, like they switch to a 100-foot linear bed to a 50-foot linear bed. So they can, you know, they get access around. And so it's amazing to see those, how those simple changes increase production and how, you know, and, and, uh, how we can, learning and learning year to year to get better and better. So we can, you know, get to two, three dollars a square foot. Great. How about a question from the audience here? Okay. Uh, tell us your name and where you're from. Hey, um, my name's Aaron Snow from Burtondale, New York. Uh, my question was for uh, the root cellar uh, fellow, I forget your name. Um, what was it? Jake. Jake, Jake. Um, my question is, uh, is the money you're getting, are you reinvesting to do like uh, a couple renovations to your store or is it just to get the new locations going? That's a good question. Um, the, the money we're looking for primarily here is to, um, you know, branch out into these new locations. Um, we, we obviously could use some, some upgrades, and some of those upgrades to our store, mostly on the packing and distribution side, will be uh, what we're looking for there. But primarily the funds are going to be to these three new micro-retail locations. Um, I did mention that we, we got a local food promotion program grant from USDA. What that does is pays for um, the equipment in these new locations. It pays for shelving and cash register and a little bit of refrigeration um, and, and those sorts of things. So what we need is a little bit of operating assistance 
license, you know, something that we can use to get that site up and running, pay that first employee a fair wage, um, you know, begin building the inventory because as has been said on these panels before, when you work in the local food business, the inventory retention rate is huge. You have to carry a huge amount of, of inventory uh, capital to just make it work. Um, so, so primarily that's what um, we're looking for help for. And, and um, you know, I mentioned we're a micro retail location. We serve 1,250 square feet in Columbia. Um, that's because when we moved into that site, we didn't really know what we were doing, as I mentioned. So we think we can even do it on a few uh, hundred less square feet in these new sites. So, so the operating capital can go a long way to pay some of that uh, you know, inventory and, and staffing and that sort of thing. So. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Miles. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, uh, originally from Boston, so way to go. Um, I actually run a aquaponics farm, farming business in Brooklyn, New York. Um, we've developed a few different uh, farming prototypes on rooftops, and uh, it's called Verticulture Farms. And my question for you is, uh, since land in urban centers is so expensive, um, and you're, many of you are already doing in a controlled environment, agriculture, in greenhouses. Um, why haven't you consider, have you considered um, going towards a hydroponic or aquaponic production system uh, that can increase productivity up to seven to 10 times? Um, and if you haven't, why haven't you considered it? And it's not something that's actually been discussed here at all. So I think it's, a, it's an important discussion. Thanks for bringing Thanks. it up. Yeah, anybody, who'd like to handle that? Here. Um, yeah. I, in Chicago, land situation is much different than New York. Um, there's vacant land all over the place that the city is trying to get rid of, and so we're in a good position. And we found it's less capital intensive to build the hoop houses. We're doing it well. We have a good model that's successful. What excites me about urban agriculture is all the different methods being used. There are two indoor farms, and we have, I think, five of our graduates have gone on to work there. So when I see different um, enterprises starting up, for me it means jobs for the people we're training. Yeah, my quick response is we're agnostic, right? So whatever we can grow, whatever we can farm. Uh, we looked at some early numbers of aquaponics. So I'd, I'd love to learn from what you guys are doing and how do we apply. Because, I mean, I think that this thing, we talk about technology as part of this conference. I mean, this is the new technology as far as I'm concerned. And trying to figure out how to, you know, get more production out of it, small intensive spaces. So um, we'd love to share information if, if you're making it work from an economic part, model. Ryan, how about you? Well, I can speak to the land acquisition piece. The proposition that I made with the city of Cincinnati was um, there was some river land that um, they were basically just mowing. And so I approached them and said, well, I can save you money. And actually, when I uh, create a business here, my employees and my business will pay taxes. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the proposition that we can make with cities is that you can actually go from having it be an expense to having it be a revenue generator mm -hmm. on vacant pieces of land. Um, in terms of the aquaponics and hydroponics, um, I would be willing to partner with someone, but right now my focus has been solely on my business and I don't want to spread myself thin by getting involved in other things. Jake? Um, yeah, I mean, we have, uh, I mentioned Show Me Produce, uh, who works with us. They are um, a, a hydroponic producer out in the, the, the countryside part of the year. So um, their structure is that they have outdoor growing space and they have some space that is in uh, hydroponic structure greenhouses. We use the um, hydroponic pricing because sometimes it is a little bit more expensive for them to produce in hard production season. So, for example, um, heated, uh, you know, that hydroponic system is heated in the, the greenhouse uh, during the cold part of the winter in Missouri. So in, in January, when it's super hard to produce greens, they're filling our winter need for that. Or in the, on the opposite end of that, in July, uh, when it's very hot and we see lettuce bolting everywhere, uh, they're able to keep their water cool and keep that down. So we are working on a bunch of levels of the supply chain to make sure that we're filling those gaps and probably fitting that technology appropriately where it should go, um, because there's kind of a time and place for all of those things, I think, in the local food system. Karen, anything yeah, from you? And we, we um, our fresh stops do purchase hydroponic, especially lettuce. We have a beautiful business across the river in Indiana called Grateful Greens. And when the lettuce is bolting outside in Kentucky, we, we purchase from them and people really appreciate it. Good. Yeah, well, well I, we feel in, in Colorado, given our climate and labor and land situation, that 
controlled environment, agriculture, uh, may be the only way that we can actually scale up local food production to the, to the level that it will ultimately need to be. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad to have the question in the room finally after <laughs> being here a couple of days. Um, yes, on this side. Hi, Casa Heron, Louisville, Kentucky. My question, I have two questions for Karen. First, um, after the Fresh Stops do expand, if, you can, if you're successful in, in expanding, raising more leaders and expanding your work, um, have you thought about doing a root seller or some type of food co-op um, with the families? That's the first question. And the second question is, with the new developments of a food hub in West Louisville and a uh, Walmart, urban Walmart store in West Louisville, both that are supported by local government, how would those two developments hurt or challenge the Fresh Stop model? Oh, thank you. Yeah, so there is a movement within the Fresh Stop leadership for a food co-op. And um, I was sent as a scout to the Park Slope co-op in Brooklyn last winter and really fell in love with the worker-owned co-op model. And so we're going to keep building the leadership because there definitely is uh, some desire for that. So it's about more leaders stepping up. Um, so... Uh, as far as I can tell, if the Walmart coming into West Louisville act, acts like the other Walmarts have acted and the other grocery stores have acted, we're going to be seeing subpar quality produce in, in West Louisville just like we've been seeing for, for years. And so um, un unless we are at the table in conversation before this even opens, which we often are not invited uh, to, and stop it before it starts, I can't see anybody, any retailers behaving any differently. Um, the, the food hub is really going to be set up mostly, as I understand it, for wholesale um, to be distributed out to different um, infrastructure and distribution channels than to the local neighborhood. So, you know, if, if um, as far as what we need more than a food hub because we don't store anything, everything is just in time in a freshed up system, and it really thrives on the direct relationship between the shareholders and the farmers. And so we don't store anything, food comes in, it's picked that morning, comes in and it's gone within two hours. You know, so if, if, the, um, if we would have been asked, what do we need to really feed people in the food deserts, we would have responded with a different answer. We would have said, you know, we need a refrigerated box truck from, for our farmers. We need more money to create um, more fresh stops and build the Fresh Stop Training Institute. And that would have gotten more food channeled to the people who need it the most. Can I just take yep. one second? I, yeah, sure. I know that question was for Karen and about Louisville specifically, but I did want to, because Walmart was brought up in that structure, I, I did want to mention that um, as we think about rural communities or any community, we often hear, well, well, that's not a food desert because it has a Walmart, it has a super center. Um, but the, the, the truth is, we don't count that as regal food at the root cellar, just so you know. Um, <laughs> secondly, uh, I, I happen to see, a, I wish I could remember the woman's name, from, from, happened to be from Chicago actually, um, did a, a TED Talk. And, and said, you know, I wasn't digging in the dirt, hoping and wishing that uh, that Walmart would move in to, to solve all my food needs. And the truth is, uh, that's not about, that's not what local food is. We believe the market um, still needs good quality local food, whether there's a Walmart Supercenter located where we're moving or not. So, yeah. Great. so I'm sorry to say that we are out of time. Um, just a couple of things to close. One is, please exercise your right to vote for these entrepreneurs today. Uh, and uh, so, so this group uh, has not had a chance to meet with you. Uh, so talk to these entrepreneurs. They're going to be available uh, this afternoon uh, during the break uh, at the, the room just outside the East Room over on this side, the, the bar area there. Please come visit. Uh, and uh, the last thing I think about is, you know, only, only two companies are going to get Bitcoin funding today, uh, but all 21 of them need funding, you know, and they put a lot of time and effort to come here and be with us. Thanks to you all for educating us about the opportunities and challenges. It's great to be with you. Thank you all.